So I picked three to talk to you guys about. So the first one is, I found it kind of interesting, but it was titled, How ECG Rhythms Impact a Patient's Activity Tolerance. Because we learned about heart rhythms and all that stuff in school, but like how often do we really pay attention to that and what does it mean? Like I think we have an idea of like, that's not safe, but we don't really think a lot about it. Um, or I don't as much as we should. So, oh. So I took some like tip, like pearls of information from each course because they were several they were each several hours. But one thing she said when you're talking about a patient's activity tolerance, what do we typically look at when we're seeing how is the patient doing? I feel like here we are looking at your oxygen a lot. We do check heart rate, um, and usually we're talking about blood pressure when we're talking about like orthostatic changes. But past that, like. You seem like you're symptomatically okay, like that's kind of what we do. But she said heart rhythm and blood pressure is actually a more adequate um, in giving you information regarding how the patient is tolerating activity. And that, that just really struck me because those are not usually the two things that I pay attention to. I'm usually looking at your oxygen, your breathing, um, and heart rate. So kind of having an idea of what rhythm they're in is kind of important um, because the rhythm what you're reading affects so much of what the heart is actually doing. And we'll go over like some common ones. But, and she said anytime there's a pressure drop, like not just orthostatic, but if you're up walking and all of a sudden there's a drop in pressure during activity, it could indicate an intolerance um, to the activity. So blood pressure and heart rhythm, really important. Um, okay, so in case you needed a, a refresher on what is rate versus rhythm, so the rate is the number of complexes on the ECG um, in a given amount of time. The rhythm is the relationship of the complex parts to each other. So um, the rhythm affects your cardiac output and can be influenced by exercise and, um, well both can be influenced by exercise, but rhythm has a big part to play in what your cardiac output is doing. So those are some fun facts. So just, I picked like three that we probably come in contact with a lot, but sinus radiocardia is, the rhythm is fine, but your rate is below 60. Um, you have to differentiate between whether your patient is a healthy athlete, which how many times do we get that, unless it was like a car accident or something, trauma, versus like you're really deconditioned. Um, so she just talked about here, if you're, obviously if your heart rate is very low, your cardiac output is gonna be lower because you're not pumping as much blood. So therefore, you're not gonna tolerate as much activity or your reserve is a lot lower. So you have to ask the patient, are they symptomatic, lightheaded, dizzy, blurred vision, any of those um, things. So that one was pretty easy. Um, sinus tachycardia, so the, the rhythm is normal, but the rate is above 100. So you have to ask yourself, like, are they at rest? and this is happening, or are they exercising? Is it an appropriate exercise response? Um, did it happen like immediately? Like that could be an indication that they don't tolerate a lot. Like if you immediately got them up from laying down to standing and their heart rate is through the roof, that's probably too much activity for them right now. Um, they could be dehydrated, caffeine, any of those. So again, that one's pretty straightforward. But AFib, I feel like a lot of people have AFib. So this was kind of interesting. She spent the most time on AFib, but basically with AFib, you're not getting a full contraction of the atria, so blood is pooling, and you're a high risk for clots. So a lot of our stroke patients, as Allison knows, um, are, have a history of AFib. But because you're not getting a full contraction of the atria, it directly affects your cardiac output, so you're not getting good blood flow to the rest of your body. Um, a lot of these patients, if they're known AFib, they're on like some sort of anticoagulant, what she really, really emphasized, like a falls risk assessment is huge. If somebody's on anticoagulation, how they fit, um, because if their fall risk is high, they have a really high chance of falling, hitting their head, getting a bleed. Um, so she, which it's gonna go into my next other courses because those are on fall risks. But um, fall, AFib is problematic to patients because it reduces your cardiac output. Um, you get pulling of the blood, and then if they have that rapid ventricular rate with it, the RVR, so um, 
you get decreased cardiac muscle perfusion. So then that puts them at a risk for a heart attack. So AFib's a big, big deal. Um, this was just a study that showed you still can exercise if you have AFib. You just have to watch, like make sure that they're not in that RVR, the rapid ventricular rhythm, where it's an uncontrollable <coughs> rate, um, like in upper 160s, 170s. But a 12-week exercise program overall was patients with AFib increase their exercise capacity, decrease their resting pulse rate, which is important because their um, window for tolerance is better, and then their cardiac output was unchanged. 